Hi everyone, welcome to the Olympic Club, San Francisco, California, the location for this year's Catino Award presentation. Greg Meskel here with you inside the famous Olympic Club as we honor the best in college water polo. Tonight, six finalists, three from the men's game, three from the women's game, all vying for the top honor in college water polo. We'll introduce you to all six, you'll hear from them, and we'll also crown a winner in both the men's and women's categories as we're back here celebrating the best in college water polo. Now, if you're new to this award, it is prestigious. It is the highest honor in college water polo. It's like other awards you may have heard of. In college basketball, it's the Naismith Award, named after basketball founder James Naismith. Ice hockey has the Hobie Baker, the Herman Trophy. In the sport of soccer, lacrosse, and football, you get the idea that that's how big the Catino Award is. It's something everyone should know about when it comes to college sports. How do you win the Catino Award? Well, here's a look at the voting process. The Division I coaches from around the country, they cast votes. You can only vote for the gender you coach. Now, in some cases, coaches do coach both the men's and women's programs. And then a fairly recent addition, past recipients get a chance to vote. It really has enhanced this Catino Award process. Speaking of past winners, here's a look at the all-time results. We started way back in 1999, Bernus the Furnace Orwig from USC, Sean Kern from UCLA repping the SoCal schools. And from there, it's a lengthy list of some of the all-time greats. We're just coming off the Olympic Games in Tokyo. A lot of these athletes, Olympic caliber. Our most recent winners, they were there. Mackenzie Fisher, Ben Halleck, when you talk about all-time greats in the sport of water polo, Odds are they've won a Catino Award, and we're honored to write the latest chapter here tonight at the Olympic Club. As that list showed, there is no lack of talent when you're talking about the all-time Catino Award winners. With that in mind, we always like to try and speak with a past winner, someone who knows what it is to get up there and receive the trophy. How did it impact them, their program, their water polo community? With that in mind, we Checked in with an old friend here, Cami Craig, a two-time winner out of USC. We spoke with her earlier on what the Catino Award meant in her water polo career. We've talked about this in the past, but but just this honor for, for, for college water polo, especially in a year like this, what do you think it's going to mean to these athletes after having gone through all this adversity to get a chance to really celebrate their sport and their team? Yeah, what an incredible year to make it through. I mean, just the mental capacity you have to – get through a year of COVID training is what I'll call it with, uh, limited practices, limited games. Um, you know, you're going in and practicing without balls with balls and just this like kind of like buildup of training, but how you stay in the pocket, how you stay focused during this time and how you continue to progress, uh, in a way that is, is meaningful to your game is, is incredible. I would say this is a year unlike any year that our athletes will probably ever see again in their careers. Um, and a big congratulations to all of the nominees that have made it to this point. One thing you hear from a lot of athletes is just how much they found out they loved their sport. Mm. You know, I think that's been a, something we learned with the college season this past year, the men, had their postponed season starting around January, then the women followed. What have you heard from athletes just on how much they realized they love this game that was taken away from them temporarily? Yes, yeah, loving the game and loving their team, right? You know, I athletes never being so happy to walk up to a pool deck and get ready to jump in and have a really challenging practice. Um, and it's, it's, it's something to experience to put things into perspective, right? How much we really do love the game, how much we really do love showing up and jumping in the pool and getting to it, but really even connection and interaction with our teammates um, and, and how much you probably are leaning on your time on your team during a time like this. Um, but yeah, I same kind of feel all the way around is you don't realize what you have until it's taken away and then it comes back and the good feeling that comes with that. Now, I know you don't have any favorites here among our finalists, but since there's two USC women that are finalists for the award in Denise Mamalito and Mount Megan's, I, I have to ask you, how, how cool must it be, and, and we've talked with them during this show, but how cool must it be for those two to be finalists together coming off of a, a national championship? You, you really can't write it any better. 
Yeah, absolutely. And again, just sharing that experience with a fellow teammate, right? I, I remember standing alongside of Tamua and I uh, and my nomination and just being able to represent your university um, and do it alongside of a teammate is, is such, uh, it's just, it's a fun experience. It's always interesting when you're highlighted as an individual athlete, when you're on a team sport, um, you're kind of used to having like a posse of uh, 25 or 15 people behind you. And it's always like, Yes, I, I played well, but also there's a whole bunch of us that contributed to this, right? Um, and so to do that alongside of you know, a fellow teammate or even a national team, you know, fellow USA teammate, uh, it, it makes it a, a far more enjoyable enjoy experience uh, as we're used to doing things together on a team sport. You, you brought up a great thing and uh, talking with all the finalists leading into the Catino Award being revealed. All of them said almost the same thing. Yes, this is great that I'm being recognized, but it's really about the team. You get a chance to accept this award twice. What, what do you remember back to saying about your teammates and, and just kind of the feelings you had about how your team allowed you to be the one that was recognized? I'm it, 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 the team's everything, right? I mean, I'm not showing up to a pool by myself training the way that we train alone. Um, they're the inspiration They're who push you when you're down. They're the ones who keep you going. Um, you know, when coaches are challenging, they're the ones that you can lean on and can really understand what you're going through. I always say the outside doesn't have a privilege to have a opinion on what we do in the water, because really it's just us that experience the season, the training, the day-to-day -day grind. Um, and it's a really intimate experience. And so team is teams, everything. And they're really the only ones that understand all that you've gone through. And Cammy, one last thing here, of course, it being Olympic year, we have to talk about the USA women, a, a team that you were on through, through three Olympic games. Uh, we were joking before we started this about just kind of watching from afar and being so excited, being emotional, yes. having all the feels right. Watching this team. Yes. As you watch them do what they did and you know all the challenges they went through, just kind of your reaction to, to seeing them do it again in, in some of the most difficult circumstances. Such an emotional experience to be a spectator this time for the first time in 15 years. I have so much respect for our parents who sit in the stands and watch us play this game. Um, but so incredibly proud. I mean, wow, what a dynasty that the girls are contributing to and we continue to build upon. Um, it was no easy task. I think, you know, everything has to go right. Uh, even when it goes wrong, you have to figure out ways to make it right throughout an Olympic tournament and watching those girls navigate that tournament and come out on top was, uh, just phenomenal. So proud of them. Congratulations to all those girls. Uh, very well said. Well, we had hoped last year when we talked that this year we were all going to be back in the Olympic club. It didn't quite happen, but Fingers crossed. Next year, Cami, we'll be back in the O Club uh, next summer to celebrate the Catino Awards in person. And uh, we're looking forward to it. Thanks so much for being here. Now time to talk this year's talent, the six finalists for the Catino Award. And we start first on the men's side out of USC, the dynamic scorer Jacob Merchep, a three-time All-American. He made a name for himself immediately. Seven goals against UCLA to start the season. He finished his career in the land of Troy with 151 goals, good for number 11 on the all-time list. He had 39 goals on the year, an NCAA All-Tournament first team pick, MPSF All-Tournament team, and of course an MPSF Player of the Week. I talked with Jacob earlier this week ahead of tonight's festivities. And, and so when you find out that you're a finalist for an honor like this, you know, it's something that many Trojans have won in the past. What's, the, what's your immediate reaction to, to when you learn you're a Catino Award finalist? Well... It's definitely an honor to be nominated for this type of an award, but uh, this is all, all the props go to my coaching staff and my teammates. They are the ones who made this possible. What do they do for you? How do they help you succeed in what you're trying to do? Everything, everything. My coaches are like my family and my teammates also from, uh, all sorts of all types of support firstly like emotional support then everything they do for me teammates like in the pool is just uh, you can see it uh, in games that's why i keep on repeating that i'm just grateful to be a small wheel in a big 
automobile of the USC. <laughs> so many of our finalists this year, they don't call America home. They're from other countries, Greece, Croatia, elsewhere. What's what's the reaction back home? As as people follow your career and they and they see that you're doing well and you're a finalist for an award and your team is fighting for championships, what are you hearing from friends and family back home? Oh, all positive. They're they're ecstatic for me and they're very happy that I'm able to share my success with them because um, I'm just a product of all of the people who've invested in me and everybody who uh, helped me in all sorts of ways. So um, they know they're a part of it too. Like um, my friends from home are very happy for me and uh, whenever I go home, I go to my original club, do some practices, see some players over there and that will always be a part of my life too this is a quick turnaround for the usc and all the men's water polo programs from last year just earlier this year to now to the season starting very soon how can the usc team build off of what happened last year and use it this season well i think we got a, we had a very very strong foundation to begin with with like now all of the players experiencing uh, national championship finals. So that's a great opportunity and a great fuel to keep on competing. And then on top of that, we got some great recruits. We got Hannes coming back. I think we have like, a, we got Ash Moulton from UCLA. So I think we got a great, great mixture of uh, youth and experience. And we definitely have that competitive drive that's as, fiery as it ever uh, as it ever been after losing at home and I think that these are all like nothing but uh, motivational like uh, motivational journey for us to go and win another national championship. How much do you think about that last national title game is that something every day? A lot. Yeah and how does it motivate you? It motivates me in a way that um I'm looking at a place of uh, USC men's water polo and what it has done for me, not just in a water polo sense, but for my life, how I grew as a person here. And I'm looking at it before I came and I'm looking at it in a way like after I will leave and I'm trying to leave it in a better place than what I found it in. So I want that to be sort of my legacy at USC. I want to do everything in my power so the next generation are set up for success. You've talked about this Katina Award obviously being a team award, but if you're able to win something like this, what would it mean to you? What would it mean to the USC team? I think I think it would be a huge honor for me to win this award, but then again, like, uh, I really believe I'm just a, a product of my teammates and if there was no one in my team to like challenge me, inspire me and deal with me every day, then uh, I don't think I would be uh, up for any award. So yeah, I really like, I'm going to be proud, but uh, the number one objective is again, the national championship. And this award is as mine as it from number one to 16 on the team. If you're talking USC, you might as well talk UCLA, a great rivalry, and our second nominee, the Bruin, Nicholas Savalich, coming off a national championship campaign with UCLA. Co-side, a first-team academic All-American selection. He was the ACWPC Player of the Year, a first-team All-American, team and conference scoring leader. 37 goals in 16 games, that's efficiency. Added 10 assists, led the NCAA with 30 steals, and he dropped eight goals against then number one Stanford. That tied the conference record for goals in a game. He currently sits as the number six scorer in Bruin history at 164. I talked with Nicholas before tonight's show about his stellar last season. When you look at your game and, and when people plan for you on defense, right? I think people look at your game and say, there's a guy that can really score, right? And you look at your stats, you have some games, six goals, seven goals, right? And I know that's not always necessary for UCLA to win, but when when you have those games where you're able to go out and score a lot, how does that happen? What's what's kind of going through your mind as you're, as you're able to really get into a groove offensively? Is it 
as simple as taking what you're given? Is it is is it a game plan? How do you describe those nights when it just seems like everything's working? So I, I, I mean, I try to be very, very consistent and approach every single game in the same manner, no, no matter if that's a first game, different opponent, or an NCAA final. So that's a pretty much the flow that I go with. You know, um, I approach every – I try to approach every practice like like it's a game, and especially last season, I think I very very much improved improved on it. So the confidence was there, and obviously the opponents are going to prepare like we prepare for, for 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 the others. So on some of the game games, you know, maybe it's a maybe it's a lack lack of uh, of defensive of defensiveness or just. Uh, the lack of preparedness of the of the opposite side, but I pretty much try to stay always the same way. So you just mentioned team, and I feel like anytime someone wins an award like this or they're nominated for an award like this, they often talk about yes, it's my name on the award or my name up for the award, but the team makes this happen. So when you think about being in a position to be a finalist like this, what what sort of credit do you pay to your team? to allow you to be the one of of many talented guys on UCLA, but one of the guys that gets the recognition? I mean, all the credit goes to them, goes to them, including coaching staff, including all the UCLA staff, you know, everyone, everyone has been working so, so, so hard for UCLA office, guys are working in the office, from, uh, compliance staff to coaches. I'm not even going to say about them. It's just like, they were fighting so hard for us to have an opportunity to even train and compete. And then all of those things just piled up after putting us in a situation to play this season. But when you say, when you say individual award, this is not an individual, individual sport. And, you know, I can't take thinking of my, my teammates for always being there for me, especially, especially for me being a international student athlete, you know, from day one, they were always there for me. I, I've been struggling a lot in the in the past with language barrier, with the, with the transition, being far away from home, and those are all the little small things that, in the end, matter, and they just come up as a such a reward. Where is my name, as I said, or someone else's? But it's it, it is really a team effort, and this is definitely a award that goes towards the entire UCLA athletics and UCLA family, but before everyone, my team, coaches included. And then this past season, the Bruins end with the ultimate award, right? Winning, winning, winning the national title. And we were talking earlier about the uncertainty and coaches and everyone trying to, to work together to make sure there would be a season. When that championship game ends and you're celebrating in the water, do you think back to the, the road you just kind of traveled? What's, what's going through your mind when you think about all the things this team went through to get to that moment. No, to be honest, when when I heard the buzzer, I was just looking for the ball. I was just like to float on it because I was just like so out of breath. I gave I gave it all in the last moment, but just seeing all of those people, especially like COVID, us being uh, under restrictions, not being able to leave the house, all this kind of stuff, and just looking at all of those faces that I spent literally every single second. Of, of my like previous six months, just jumping in the water, being all happy with, as you said, all this, all, all this uncertainty and stuff. Just seeing all those happy faces and the amount of work we put into into the last season and every season we we compete is just is just insane, you know. And when it just when it pays off, when you do everything in the right way, and in the end, you see how it, how it pays off and. Everything, everything you've done to be in that situation with all those people that you love the most around you, happy, celebrating, with, like for the ultimate goal is just like it's priceless. I don't think it can be explained with the words. You gotta be, you gotta be in the pool with us next time, hopefully. Now you're from a place in the water polo world, Montenegro, that loves the game. So what's been the reaction back home? to you winning a national title, to you being a finalist for this award. Not that we don't love water polo in the U.S., but you go to Montenegro, you know it, Croatia, Serbia, there's a deep love for the sport. What's been the response to some of the things you've been able to achieve here in the U.S.? 
I mean, that's a that's a great question. Thank, thanks for bringing that up. I mean, yeah, my home country, Montenegro, is just as a, like football, American football is in the U.S. It's a national sport there. I grew up, people here, people in the U.S. go surf at the beach. And people in Montenegro, as a kid, they go and like play water polo in, a, in like a sea ocean, in a, in a sea ocean pool. You know, so it's just like seeing all those bases that the OGs that I've been seeing pretty much as since I was since I was a kid returning from my old club versus now when I when I returned to home uh, during the COVID, especially after the season, they were like, oh, like we saw we saw UCLA did it. You guys got it done. Great season. We were able to watch and just like seeing the random people on the street. And they were like, oh, we even tuned, tuned in. That was a really tough game. And just like your heart is filled in with love, even though it's nine hour, nine, nine hour of difference, people were still able to catch up on it and be there and support us, Brent. Last but not least, our final men's finalists. We head up to the Bay Area, the Cal Bear, Nikos Papanikolaou, the conference player of the year in the MPSF. He has been a dynamic piece of the Berkeley attack since his first year on campus. He was a first-team All-MPSF selection, finished the year 25 goals, 14 steals, scored in all 10 of the Golden Bears' regular season games. He also did it away from the ball, drawing 44 exclusions. He's the only player in the MPSF this season to draw six exclusions against a conference opponent. He did so twice. Nikos talked with us before tonight's event about his year with the Cal Bears and what being a finalist means to him. I have to start first with as a Catino Award finalist, there's a little something extra when it's a Cal Bear. When you're when you're a Cal Bear and you're a finalist for this award, just given the ties to to Coach Catino, I feel like it means a little something extra. What's what's your take on that? Is is there something extra special about this when you play at Cal? Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, it's it's an honor for me uh, since uh, you know it's an uh, honor of uh, Catino playing in Cal for so many years. So yeah, it's something special and means a lot. To, uh, I'm pretty sure it means a lot to the team and to my coach, especially Kirk Everest, who has been here for like the last 20 years or so. So yeah, it's for sure something uh, really unique. Everyone we've talked to about these honors, they, they always talk about how the how the team plays a big role in allowing an individual to get recognized like this. So. For example, for you to be a finalist, uh, there's so much the team has to do to help make this happen. What's what's your sense of how of how the team has allowed you to be uh, an important force here in water polo? I mean, both 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 my coaches, uh, Jeff and uh, Kirk, uh, allow me and my teammates uh, to actually have freedom in the pool. Uh, we have the obligation to practice hard uh, mm -hmm. during our workouts. And uh, it's going to pay off in the game eventually. And uh, yeah, I mean, they're very friendly and they help us uh, pursue our uh, both our like team goals and our personal dreams as we're polo players. So yeah, I think they, they pushed me towards being a, a good team finalist. And I have to thank them for that. This was such a different year with the pandemic and the season was postponed and everyone has their own story of how all this worked. How did it... How did it work for the Cal Bears? How did how did this team stay stay as one even when you can't practice the way you'd like or play the games you think you're going to play? How did the group work through that? I mean, 2020 was a very difficult year for Cal. Uh, for like six months since uh, August, we didn't have a pool till January that we started again. So actually, we had to gather as a team and go to. I remember going to. To the sea to the ocean here in san francisco sometimes and just swim just uh i don't know and it was like i remember waking up at like 6 a.m with uh, the rest of my teammates pushing me to go to practice 6 a.m to the cold water but i think uh, the, the important part of that is that uh we stayed together together in this we practiced we, we tried to stay in shape as much as we could it was very difficult we didn't have a pool like for as i told you like six months uh, but yeah, I think eventually when January came, we weren't, we weren't so much out of shape and we have to attribute that to, you know, the team effort that we push each other every day, uh, to go to the ocean, the cold water and practice again and again. And, um, we had a good run last season and, uh, I, I think we can attribute to that because we only had two weeks to prepare before our uh, season started in January. 
you know, people back home might think, hey, you get to swim in the ocean in California. That sounds very nice, but uh, that water is pretty cold. Yeah, yeah, it's very cold. I, I don't know the Fahrenheit because uh, I'm from Europe, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it would have been like uh, 12, 13 uh, Celsius. I don't know how, how that's much cold. that is in Fahrenheit, <laughs> but that's pretty cold. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So building off of that, even even though this this past season didn't didn't have the result, right? Every time you want to win a championship, even though that wasn't the result, how can you use that? How can the team use what happened last season going forward? I mean, as I, as I said, we had a very good run during regular season. We we won most of our games. We were first, uh, but uh, I don't know something something didn't work out work out in the semifinal on the SWS. USC played better, as I said. Mm -hmm. uh, we were not really ready, um, but uh, for sure we can just keep the good parts of that season, like the fact that uh, uh, we stood up against uh, USC, Stanford, and UCLA. All of them are such good teams, and uh, we beat them most of the times. And we can keep the good things from those games and uh, work on those and get better and get better when another semifinal, hopefully, of NCAA comes this or next seasons we are ready for that and uh, we can actually win and put the final then eventually i don't know so many of the finalists this year for the catino awards they're from places outside of the u.s they call europe home different countries you're in the same situation what's what's the response back home when people uh keep an eye on your career and they and they hear that you're playing well they see that you're a finalist for the catino award that you're on a really good team what are you hearing from friends and family back home I have I have their support. Obviously, my family is there for me like every day. Mm -hmm. uh, my siblings and my parents, uh, and my friends, my work, my former teammates from uh, Greek clubs. Uh, I get texts from them saying like uh, "good job," how it's going, and uh, they they follow us. And uh, a lot of coaches, like my my former coach, also uh, keeps in touch with me, and like he's really proud. But uh, yeah, I think that uh yeah there we thought their support my families first of all and my friends and former teammates and coaches that they actually like uh actually train with them and they kind of helped me be where i am right right now uh, i don't know if i could be here you know so yeah. very cool very cool uh last thing for you nikos here you know obviously we don't know the results yet but if if you're able to be the winner of this award what would that mean to you what would that mean to the cal program uh, I mean, for me, obviously, I'm going to be like super excited. Uh, it's a personal award. I for sure want to, to, to like dedicate this uh, to the team. Like I want to, I want to win something with my team, with my teammates and celebrate with them. But it's a personal award. It's, it's such a prestigious award that, uh, for sure it's, uh, it's something like very special. Uh, to me and for sure to, Cal, to the Cal program because uh, in this way other uh, freshmen or kids that are going to come play for Cal, they're going to know that it's not so uh, difficult, but it is kind of difficult, but it's not so distant to sure. to get to the Coutinho Award. And um, yeah, it's all, it's all about the program actually here in Cal. And uh, I'm uh, very grateful to be a part of it and to represent it in uh, such uh, a prestigious award. Typically, the Catino Award is held in early June, right after women's season, but still plenty of time to go before the men's campaign. But the pandemic pushing things back a little bit, and it leaves us right now tonight on the eve of the men's college water polo season set to begin around the country this weekend. Top 25 polls are out, schedules are set, and we're excited to kick off a brand new slate of men's college water polo. With that in mind, let's take a look ahead to what to expect before we get to our NCAA championship this December. And now we're talking with USA Water Polo Chief High Performance Officer and the ACWPC Executive Director, John Abdu, uh, knows the college game well. Coach, thanks for being here. Yeah, no worries, Greg. Glad to be here. Uh, so awesome to have college water polo back here after so much of the unknown of 2020, the men's season getting pushed into a weird time, right? You're going to have a really two men's seasons in 2021, but I know as someone who loves the game, it was, it was just exciting to see college water polo back and being played. Yeah. I mean, and really the story of last season was that it had, it got to happen. Uh, and so all the work, there were a lot of people behind the scenes working to make sure that the season happened. 
and being flexible and adaptable um, to make sure that season worked, but no more than the athletes and the coaches and the teams to do that. So more than anything, it was just a, a, a testament of their perseverance and adaptability to make sure a season happened and they got to compete in 2020. And, and we know the athletes, they obviously did the bulk of the work here, but you work with a lot of coaches, you coach at the college level. I was, I was thinking about coaches during this time because most mm-hmm. coaches are regimented. They know their plan. They know what they want to do going into a mm-hmm. season. This had to be challenging for coaches too to figure out what do I do now? I can't I can't train the way we used to, but I need to keep my team together. What what have you heard from coaches just the way they were able to kind of keep their squads together? I mean, they're doing it the same way we're doing it now, right? Yeah. I mean, we've <laughs> all become Zoom experts. We've all become uh, Zoom, you know, captains really, and that's what uh, and I think really have found a lot of comfort in it because there's a way for us to connect with our athletes, connect with our teams, you know, create a group setting while we're all separated at the same time. And so I think you saw a lot of creativity in the sense of, uh, of Zoom and online. I think you saw a lot of creativity with coaches and what they did with practice. Like I was amazed and impressed with what coaches could do to create physically distant practice, right? So when it's like when the school or the city pool said you can have practice or you can train, but you got to keep physically distant, just the amount of creativity and um, you know work that was put in by coaches and athletes to create really meaningful training and meaningful workout without contact is another testament to just the adaptability and perseverance of, of the sport of water polo. And a big night tonight in college water polo with the Catino award to be announced for both the men's and women's recipients on the men's side, uh, three greatly talented athletes, real international flavor here, all coming from outside the U S Papa Nicolau, Savalich, Merchep. What do those guys bring to the college game when they have experience with other national teams from other countries they've just seen a different style they bring something extra yeah i mean look the international male player has been a staple in ncaa water polo for decades right so we can you can go back and find international water polo you know seasoning in 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 ncaa water polo and across teams uh uh in in the league uh and i think what the european players or we'll call foreign athletes that come in and so they always bring is a level of maturity that's different than what the American student athlete brings, right? That um, there's a different sort of level of experience, no doubt with playing, but there's also a maturity level of knowing what you want. If you're gonna choose to move across the globe away from your family and your friends to attend a school, to get a degree, to you know, complete your, your uh, athletic and academic career, um, there's a, that's a commitment that you're making. This is as opposed to, and this is no knock on our American athletes, right? The, Kind of traditional process, and so there's a, a larger buy-in uh, when you have these elite uh, athletes like the three aforementioned that are up for uh, the Catino Award tonight. That they're what they're doing here. They came for a reason. And they want to see those goals through, and that has always been the experience of, of why I think they do so well. And, and furthermore, we were both home from the uh, recently from the Tokyo Olympics. You see that not only um, do we get has, has there historical uh, historically been a lot of uh, uh, foreign athletes that uh, play at elite level in the NCAA, but you're also seeing now that elite foreign athletes are coming to the NCAA, you know, with a purpose, meaning that the level of athlete is rising that's choosing to come to play in the NCAA in the, in the men's league. So people like Kostas Jadunias, who wins a silver medal uh, with Greece at these last Olympics, so people like Balash Elderly, right, who's winning a bronze medal with um, uh, uh, Hungary at the, at the last Olympics, having played for USC and University of Pacific, respectively, those are incredibly high level Olympic athletes that have ties now in the NCAA and those, and there will be more in the future. There's more that I haven't mentioned and there'll be much more in the future. Yeah, it does. It does uh, go a long way to really help validate the high quality of the men's college game. We know how strong it is in the European leagues and elsewhere, but great to see that for the men's college game as well. Uh, Mm -hmm. Your, your zoom background here, it's the old Bucknell pool. Well, it's not the old, it's still the pool, but it's, it's your old stomping grounds. And, uh, as we're talking tonight, the season just a couple of days away. What do you remember from kind of that excitement when you've kind of gone through maybe your your difficult preseason training and now you're on the cusp of starting a new year and especially a season like this where we're finally back to what should be a regular schedule? Yeah, I mean, I think what what it was most exciting, I would think, for the coaches and the athletes is is playing home games with fans potentially coming up, like getting that excitement again around the sport. We often talk about, you know, all of us who are trying to grow the game, that water polo should be marketed better. Or, you know, all the, we want more eyes on the sport and all these great things that are happening. We get the game on TV and, and, and things like that, but there is absolutely no substitute 
or playing in an environment where people care about the campus. They care about the school much more than they care about the sport. So you see the pool behind me. My best memories at Bucknell would be a Friday night game against Princeton where the, the stands would be packed. There'd be, you know, 1,200 people there. The windows you see behind is the fitness center. There's people pounding on the windows and standing room only. These people don't know water polo rules. They don't know water polo tendencies, but they care a lot about their campus. They care a lot about their teammates. And, and that's the kind of environment that you get uh, when you have like the colleges behind each other in, in rivalries. And it's, so it's not about just water polo being promoted. It's about being promoted in what is a rivalry and a very spirited setting like a college or a high school or any of these things that we talked about. So I think everyone's super excited. I'm sure to get back on campus amongst their teammates, amongst their non-water polo friends, right, who are all excited to come watch them play. And, and I know, you know, now in your role with the ACWPC, one of the big focuses, mm -hmm. right, health of the college game, growing the college game, more play opportunities. One of the big exciting things and the pandemic really threw the schedule upside down, but we're finally mm -hmm. headed for a second division three national championship on the men's side. Mm -hmm. I know the women's one, everyone's excited about that for the very first time coming next year. Uh, this has really been an opportunity to provide a high level play event for so many teams that maybe wouldn't always get a chance at the regular NCAA title. Yeah, and I think what, what exactly what you're talking about. Let's give people a chance to win something meaningful. And and the, the one of the best things that happened right before the pandemic was that inaugural Division Three Men's Championship hosted by Whittier College. And you get to see that what I got to see, and many of us who were sitting, you know, poolside during their uh, organizing this thing and leading it, we got to see how fired up those parents were and those fans were. And again, there were probably a thousand people there watching the game, plenty plenty of families, but also people who were just there to cheer for their school. And they were so excited. And when they threw their uh, uh, coach and their teammates jumped in the water after after the championship, it meant something to them. So what we want to create is meaningful pathways of competition for schools, not only to keep their programs, but for new schools to add. Uh, and I'm thrilled that the D3 championship will continue and come back. And so it'll bring some equity into creating these, these meaningful games. But I think what you're going to see is in spite of COVID, uh, we survived that college water pole survived. Right. College water polo survive. There's a lot of gloom and doom always out there of like what's going to happen with our sport at the collegiate level. But things like the Catino Award, things like this D3 championship, things like all of us coming together for these big events uh, as we are tonight. It, it shows that our strength and it shows that not only did we survive, but I see a pathway for growth moving forward that um, we should all be excited about. And now we turn to our women's finalists where USC is well represented with two out of three big names honored tonight. We start first with the team captain and the speedster Denise Mamalito. COVID gave her an extra year of eligibility and she took full advantage. The team captain piled up 51 goals, 13 multiple goal outings. She delivered a seven goal game against Stanford, all part of that national championship effort this season for USC. And you look over her career, a two time all MPSF first team pick, a four time all American selection. She ends her time at USC as the number 10 scorer in program history with 174 goals. I talked with Denise about her time at USC and finishing her career on a high note. What's the, what's the last five years plus meant to you as a member of USC water polo? Um, everything. Uh, I, this experience was super special to me. Um, it really exceeded every expectation that I had coming into it. Um, I've met friends that are going to be my friends for life. Um, I got to play for an amazing water polo program. Um, it, it was really everything I could ask for and more. So over your time, you grew into a leadership role, right? Eventually becoming a captain on this team. And I'd imagine entering a program like USC can be a little intimidating. There's a lot of tradition, expectation. What was it like to kind of go from, you know, someone just trying to crack the rotation, right? And, you know, playing important minutes as a freshman to then being looked at as a, as a leader on this team. Yeah. Um, I think for me, I've kind of always been more of a leader by example, not much of a vocal leader. I'm kind of a shy person. Um, so kind of growing into that role and I have a lot of teammates and friends that I've been able to reach out to like Amanda Longan, Brianna DeBoe, people that I look up to um, and I'm lucky enough to have really good friendships with. Um, so they've kind of helped me out along the way. Um, and it was kind of an easy trans transition for me just because my teammates are so great. Um, so it, it wasn't, it wasn't too much to deal with, I guess. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm lucky with the teammates that I have. And speaking of teammates, one of your teammates is also a finalist with you, Mad Megan's, and 
uh, when I talk with her, I'll ask her the same thing about you, but kind of just your, your take on getting a chance to play with her and what you thought that she brought to the team. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm so blessed to have gotten to play four seasons with her. Um, anytime you have an opportunity to play with one of the best players in the world, um, it definitely makes your life easier. Uh, she sees the pool so well, um, her, her ability to set up her, her teammates, she truly makes everybody around her um, a better player. Her performance in the national championship game, that's, that's one of those legendary type days where you're able to just go off and play so well in such an important match. As that's unfolding and, and just the way your team is playing, right? You're such a dominant force in that game. Is there a moment where you're a little bit in disbelief at how this is all unfolding? Are you even aware of of what she's doing and, and how big the margin is getting. What are your memories of that match? I think going into the match, we, we knew that we hadn't played our best game together. Um, we had a lot of games where it was like, oh, this player played really well, this player played really well. But we hadn't really had a game where it, we were just clicking on all cylinders. And it was really cool to see that in the most important game of the season that we were able to do that. Um, and, and to see Maud end her career like that was amazing. Um, Bailey had a spectacular game there. Uh, it's just, it's great to see your teammates uh, perform at the highest level. As you think about this honor and all the athletes we've, we've, we've talked to so far, they, they speak to the idea that yes, it is an individual award, but it really speaks to the team, right? You don't, you don't get a chance to kind of get this accolade, even being a finalist, if you don't have a really strong team supporting you. So when you hear you're a finalist for an award like this, do you immediately think team? What what kind of comes to mind? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's a huge honor even to be considered. Um, but the reality of things, like you said, it's a it's a team recognition because I wouldn't be in this position if it weren't for my teammates, my coaches, uh, our athletic trainers, uh, USC athletic department, our our parents. There's so many people that go into this. Um, yeah, so I'm just super lucky with all the people that I'm surrounded with. So many water polo players spent time away from the pool due to the pandemic. It was maybe the longest time they'd been out of the water since they learned to swim. I mean, you hear some of these stories, right? They had not been out of the pool for that long since they were three years old, something crazy like that. What What did you miss most about competitive water polo that when you finally were able to get back into it, you were like, yes, like this is what, this is why I do this. Um, I think just the as aspect of competition, it wasn't even necessarily just playing games, but going at it with your teammates every practice. Um, that was something that I really missed. Um, and we kind of tried to emulate that <laughs> with my family. We played a lot of board games. Sometimes we got a little bit too heated, <laughs> um, but yeah, that was definitely something that I missed a lot. And just being around my teammates, um, you don't like, it sounds really cliche, but you don't realize what you have until it's gone. Um, and from going to say, being with your best friends every single day to kind of being forced to live this like virtual life where we can only see them over Zoom and FaceTime, um, that was super tough too. And so as your collegiate water polo career comes to a close, you know, I know you're excited to kind of continue to play uh, abroad and, and look for other opportunities out there. How do you think USC got you ready for, for what's to come? Yeah, I think, I think that USC has definitely prepared me in a lot of ways. Um, I've, I've grown a lot um, as a player, but more importantly as a person over the last five years. Um, I think that it's, it, USC has forced me to kind of have discipline, uh, mental toughness, learn how to be a leader. And I, I know that all the things, um, that I've learned from USC, I'm going to be able to take with me into my water polo career. And even further on, uh, once I get a job, once I start a family, um, so I'm super thankful for everything that, that this program has given to me. From one USC Trojan to another, we turn to Maud Megans and talk about a busy year. After helping USC to a national title, she then capped up for the Dutch at the recently completed Tokyo Olympic Games, all part of a stellar run for one of the best in the game. Megans delivered 50 goals for USC this past year, and she had a lot of awards to go with it. ACWPC Player of the Year, MPSF Player of the Year, MPSF Tournament MVP, First Team All-America pick, NCAA Tournament MVP, MPSF Tournament MVP. She scored six goals in the National Championship game. Talk about clutch. Of course, the Trojans won it all. And she finishes her career as the number six all-time scorer at USC with 213 goals. 
She's exhausted, but Mao joined us earlier this week to talk about an unbelievable run in 2021. Mao, what a year for you to say you were busy is an understatement, right? To go from the women's water polo season NCAA championship right into the Olympics. You've played a lot of water polo. What's the last seven or eight months been like for you? Well, I was really fortunate that I was able to play uh, because during the pandemic, a lot of seasons and water polo was shut down and to actually be able to play in the American season was great. Uh, therefore, I could keep my water polo experience during the year high and play as many games as possible as a preparation for the Olympics. So it was great for me. Now, you can't really script a, a better college season when you're talking about the way you want to lead into a busy summer, right? When you're talking about the team playing well, winning the NCAA championship, playing so well in that title game. As, as you think back on that run to the NCAA title and just the way you and the team were able to play in that final game, what really stands out to you? I think what really stands out was the team dynamic. Uh, we always talk about a Trojan family, and I think that feeling was really high this year, especially because we were kind of closed off as a team together because of COVID. We really bonded and grew together even more, and you can really see it with all the games towards the championship game. Like everyone was on the scoreboard, everyone wanted to the other player like play their best game, and everyone covered each other's shifts. And in center plays, we just had a real team effort, and I think that actually like benefited us all the way to the end and let everyone play their best game when it mattered. So often the championship game, the gold medal game is this really close, tight game down to the final minutes. That wasn't what happened at all in the NCAA final. It was a really dominant effort by USC. As, as that's happening and you're, you're just scoring goals nonstop in this game, you played really, really well. Are you almost in a little bit of disbelief that it's, it's this much of a gap? Is that even on your mind? How are you processing what ends up being a fairly lopsided result. Yeah, because we were prepared for a close game. Uh, we really, our coach like really hammers it in, says like, be prepared for the final game. I think our experience with playing finals like helped us a lot uh, in comparison to UCLA. Uh, I think we were really hungry because we really wanted to play our season, get out with a win and play for our like super seniors, the girls that had to play another year and stayed in school to actually play with us. And we're really thankful for them for even being there. And I think like during the game, you notice that you're up, but you also know it's water polo and everything can happen. So you're trying to stay focused and not get too excited and like too much halfway through. So everyone had to like stay grounded, stay focused on their tasks and play it out and play as well as we could. And I was really happy with the result. And I think everyone in the team felt like this is what we could do that day. And we played through our best potential and it was great. Now, I, I think I talked to you maybe 10 minutes after that game ended uh, at UCLA. And now you've had a few months to kind of reflect back on it. When you think about how you played individually and you're able to score that many goals, six, I believe, in that, in that championship game, how does that sort of thing happen? I mean, I know how it happens, right? You shoot, it goes in, they pass you the ball, but to get in that sort of groove, what, what do you kind of attribute all of that happening to? Well, it's really the trust of everyone in the team and they're believing in, in me and in each other. And at one point you get like in a flow and you think like, I can take on the world at this point, I'm just gonna <laughs> go for it. And when you're in that mindset as a team and as an individual, I think like everything's possible and it really came together this game for me. And I'm really grateful that I had that opportunity. And yeah, I think it was like, I'm really blessed that it happened that way because I couldn't wish another college ending game in, in this way. And yeah, I really thank my team and my coach for that because they're the one that made it happen for all of us. You talked about other seniors that stuck around and came back for another year. And one of your fellow finalists, Denise Mamolito, uh, a captain on your team, and I just talked with her not long ago, leading into our Catino Awards festivities. And I asked her to tell me about what it's like to play with Maud. So I'm going to ask Maud, what's it like to play with Denise when you think about being by her side for all those years? Oh, it's it's been amazing. I couldn't wish for a better teammate than Denise. She's such a hard worker. Like I, I envy like how much heart she has for the game and how much like work she does during the game because sometimes it goes unseen because everyone can see the girl that scores, but you don't always see the girls that make it happen. And I feel like Denise is like one of those girls that's really underappreciated in the team because she works so hard and she passes to so many people and makes sure that everyone else around her plays great. 
And then for her to step up herself and even score so many goals that game as well is amazing. And I think like this past four years, it's really been a blessing to play with her. Now we're here, of course, talking about the Catino Award. Have you thought about what it might mean to win that honor, not just for you, but for, for your teammates, for everyone that kind of supports you? What what would earning that award mean mean to you and all those people? I mean, it would mean the world for me because I, I come from Holland and already the chance to play here in America for NCAAs was like a huge, huge achievement. And I'm so grateful for the opportunities I got here, like the sports environment, the people around me, uh, my teammates and my coaching staff, like they, they've stand behind me, like through this whole experience through the whole four years. And it's also like a price for them. And if I was, if I was able to win it, like it's just as much for them as for me, because I really think that they made me a better player. And this whole prize would be like a cherry on the cake of my whole college experience at SC. And now we talked about the college season, also the Olympic games. And I know the result for the Dutch wasn't, wasn't what your team had hoped for, but what, what do you take away from that experience and how do you use it going forward? I mean, it was a great honor to re represent my country at the Olympics. It's definitely something that m many people can say. So I'm really happy I was there and experienced everything uh, and how the tournament was like. I'm sure we could have done better, but I think as a team, it was our first Olympics. There was no one there that already uh, had been in previous years. So I think it's a good step forward for also little girls in the Netherlands that want to play water polo and saw us on TV. And hopefully we really like push them to like come play water polo or go to the pool and ask if they can be on a team because that would really be something that only make the sports bigger. And maybe hopefully we can build an environment just like here in the United States back home regarding water polo and people enjoying sports and like putting themselves out there in something they love. And now we switch gears to the Stanford Cardinal and their finalists this year in Sarah Class. Class has been a mainstay on some dominant Cardinal teams and was a key piece of this last year's squad. 47 goals to lead the Cardinal team, a first team All-America pick, first team All-MPSF, NCAA All-Tournament first team, MPSF All-Tournament team, took care of business in the classroom as well, MPSF All-Academic, 12 multi-goal performances, including three goals in at least 11 different games, can't forget the seven she dropped against Indiana. She led the MPSF with 67 sprints won, also second in the league with 2.5 goals per game. And water polo, it runs deep in the class family. We talked with Sarah earlier this week about this past season at Stanford and what being a finalist means to her. To be a finalist for this award, and, and every finalist has echoed some similar thoughts about it being reflective of their team as well. But when you hear that you're a finalist, for an honor like this, what kind of comes to mind? Well, I know I've just like heard um, kind of about the Katina Award, like as growing up, always hearing about the finalists and um, things like that. I think kind of like what you said, people always, I don't really go into the season with the expectation of, oh, I want to be a Katina finalist. Um, you kind of go into the expectation of wanting to win an NCAA championship. And I think um, becoming a Katina finalist is just something that happens kind of as a byproduct of pushing for success with your team, but um, it is like a super special award, kind of like the Heisman for our sport. So I think it's awesome to um, definitely brings um, some more recognition to water polo, which is super important um, to help grow the sport. This was such a strange year for pretty much all of us, right? But especially college athletes where you kind of had a season last year, but not really. And then you're waiting to see what's going to happen. Uh, what, what was that process like to try and keep your team connected with all the uncertainty and then get the green light and have a 21 season and try and really ramp it up and get back to where you'd expect you'd be. Yeah, I think it was pretty difficult in the fall. We had um, about probably a third of our team on campus training together and then the rest of it, people were at home. We had a lot of Zooms together. I think JT really tried to keep us together and kind of push through the uncertainty. Like you said, there was a lot of it. We didn't really know if we we're going to have a season until and kind of got to campus and um, things started progressing. But I think just kind of um, focusing more on the team and not as much um, as like the end, you know, we, we want to have a season, but if it doesn't happen, you've, um, you still want to be pushing for the goals that you have. And I think keeping like the end goal in mind, even if you might not get the season that you're exactly looking for, like um, this season was pretty different, didn't get a lot of preseason games um, and had just had a lot of conference games. But I think just like, 
overall being able to play was um, one of the most things I was appreciative for. And in this season, this past one, I know it didn't end with the way you would have liked it. You know, I'm sure every senior looks at it like it'd be great to go out with a title and kind of finish on top. But as you think back on on the way this year ended, especially with all the uncertainty coming into it, that there might not have even been a season as you kind of were just hitting on. What what are your takeaways from that? How do you feel feel good about the year that was when you know the expectations at Stanford right are to typically win a title? Yeah, I think like you said, it fell short of expectations, but I think we also kind of had a very difficult circumstances going into the year. Um, so just kind of like reminding myself about that, but then also um, looking forward to kind of the experience that everyone else got to get throughout the year and kind of how the experience will push um, the next three years of Stanford Cardinal, the people that got to experience this year, kind of unprecedented and super difficult. But also I think it was, um, it really bonded the team together. We got to live together this year, which we normally don't do. And then just got to spend a ton of time together. Um, so I think definitely motivating factors for the team for the next coming years, um, which will be super special to be able to watch. Over the last year, away from the pool, you and some of your teammates get a chance to focus on some non-water polo things. I'm thinking of swim for diversity, things like that. Why, why was that an important thing? And what did that bring to you when you couldn't do water polo and other things uh, that you'd normally be focusing on? Mm -hmm. So um, we had a lot of conversations within our team and then um, kind of put out a team statement showing our support. But I think it was super special because our coaches pushed us kind of as what what's next. You're not just going to put out a statement. You're going to actually take action against something. Um, so I think it was the support of our coaches and the push from our coaches that really made us want to develop some for diversity and um, draw awareness because um, we're obviously super privileged. We get to play water pool at Stanford. And I know that's not the reality for a lot of people. A lot of people are concerned about water safety and access um, to water. So I think just being able to recognize our privilege and then be able to draw attention and um, raise money to increase water safety, water um, access to water for everyone and, um, is super special. Stanford obviously plays a big role in your family, your dad, your older sister, now you, as this kind of chapter is is kind of winding down for the for the class group unless is, is there a younger sibling on the way no this is no. it right? <laughs> so uh as as this kind of comes to a close what it's probably hard to sum up but how do you explain the impact stanford water polo has in the class household yeah wow um yeah i think <laughs> to, to reflect back i mean stanford water polo has been a part of my life um like forever since my dad I always got to hear about um, him going to Stanford and loving water polo there. And so it was always a goal of mine and my sisters to be able to attend there and then be able to make that dream reality it was super special. So I think um, being able to reflect on that is like kind of a big deal. I haven't like totally been able to do it since it's been like a recent ending, um, but it has been really special. And I think Stanford water polo, like always be a part of me. I'll always want to go watch games and cheer on the team and go to alumni events. Um, because I think Stanford, they kind of say like, it's not a four year decision, it's a 40 year decision. So I know that I'll always um, like be welcome at the farm and um, Stanford water will always be a part of me. Now, last year at our Coutinho Award presentation, we didn't get a chance to honor women's water polo the way we would have liked. The pandemic cut short the season and there was no Coutinho Award winner on the women's side. But this year, the women, they've left no doubt about their importance and dominance in the sport of water polo. Our three finalists have showed you that in the college game. That segued nicely into the summer in Tokyo, where the USA women won their record third straight Olympic gold medal. They are a juggernaut that doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon, and their roster, their program, is filled with Katino Award winners going back to the very first year. With that in mind, we caught up with Team USA head coach Adam Krikorian to talk all things Tokyo. Plus, as somebody who's coached a host of Katino Award winners, we discuss why this honor is something everyone should be talking about. And now we're joined by the USA Women's National Team head coach, fresh off the Olympic Games, Adam Krikorian. Uh, well rested joining us here? <laughs> um, yeah, maybe a little bit more so than, than two weeks ago, but still... I still need a couple of weeks, I think, to get back into it. Totally fair. Totally fair. Appreciate you taking a few minutes. Uh, what what a summer for Team USA. Uh, I know you talk about it all the time. You know, people talk three peat, but these are three individual teams. This past team went went through challenges uh, unlike any other through the pandemic. You know, I know you're a few weeks removed, but just 
kind of what what stands out about about this group and and all they were able to overcome in achieving their mission yeah i mean this group is made of winners i mean they're just the fiercest competitors uh, i mean i think you saw that uh in that final game against spain it's they love to compete they love to compete at the highest stage um you know when a challenge is is put in front of them uh they just get they get excited um they don't view it as an obstacle they they view it as an opportunity and uh again we saw that at the olympic games saw it after we we rebounded after that loss to hungary uh yeah and it's been a trying trying year but again uh i i think we'll probably appreciate the last 18 months a little bit more five ten years from now um than we do now but again the one thing i'll just re-emphasize is just uh our ability and their ability just to be able to to see those obstacles um set the vision set the course and and be able to do whatever it takes to to finish at the top of the mountain like we did now prior to team usa you spent a long time coaching college water polo college water polo was postponed in some cases canceled when talking about the last women's season so uh, you've you've been through those years where you're planning for a year so many athletes had so much uncertainty could you imagine what it would be like here to not to not know when that college season might restart and then the joy that everyone had to be able to play finally earlier this year yeah i mean i can just only speak from my experience you know i i was uh i think i saw it all as a student athlete myself as an assistant coach as a head coach there's nothing like the college experience i mean the the amount of uh joy and enthusiasm and energy that that the college campuses bring and the opportunity to to represent your school your teammates um and in a competitive format within the nc2a or the college system is one of a kind and uh you know my thoughts have, have been with those colleges obviously it's been a difficult road for them not just us uh, but to see them back in action and back playing the sport that they love with the people that they love at the school that they love and to see those rivalries back intact uh, to see the energy hopefully of some fans and hopefully more fans you know later on um in in this season i i, I couldn't be more thrilled about the the upcoming college seasons and what's in store for them after this this difficult stretch now we know the men's college season is about to get underway this coming weekend but we gotta make sure we shed some more light on the women's season that was and the three finalists for the Katino award three women you are very familiar with you just saw Mount Megan's for the Netherlands in Tokyo and Denise Mamalito Sarah class they've been in that team USA system three talented players your your thoughts on those finalists yeah, I mean, they're all incredibly deserving, obviously, and, and very talented. Uh, Denise and, and Sarah, both Sarah's been, uh, was with our our program for a long time, um, had a lot of success at the younger ages, uh, extremely talented, fast, dynamic player, um, intelligent, um, obviously comes from a family that that had some success in the, in the water polo world and first class person, uh, couldn't be more happy for her, Denise uh incredible leader uh great defensive player um just great knowledge um very humble and selfless probably one of the best teammates i think anyone could could ever ask for obviously happy for her and and maud uh, obviously um you know coming from outside of our country but she added you know there's so much that i think um our call system gets from these international players that come into our uh nc2a system and the the intelligence the vision uh honestly she's one of the best uh in in the world and maybe one of the best ever to play the game she's i've just been always so so impressed with her and all three are, are fantastic and again well well deserving and now we look ahead to next spring gonna have a what we hope to be a full women's college water polo season and i know some of your team usa athletes they're excited to get back on campus maddie musselman Paige hoschada among them you've done this before but what is it like to to see athletes go from the olympic games back into the college game and kind of see them bring some stuff from team usa to campus yeah well i think it'll be a, a tough adjustment for them in, in some ways but at the same time i think they i think they'll really enjoy it i think um um maybe a little bit of pressure will be taken off them um they can they can enjoy the success they had internationally and and uh share some of that leadership and that that knowledge and 
and just their talent. Um, I think having, you know, those four players back specifically, um, along with Ryan Neuschel, who, who was with us as well. I mean, those are some, some of the best players, not only in the country, but in the world and to bring them and, um, inject that talent and in, into our college system, I think is going to make it a, a very competitive, uh, and a very exciting college season is just going to raise the level back to, uh, probably where, where it was, uh, before the pandemic hit. Yeah, we have to add, of course, uh, the Fishers, McKenzie, and Aria also with some college uh, eligibility left. You've coached a host of Catino Award winners, whether your time at UCLA or Team USA. Everyone we've talked to tonight really put a focus back on the team when it comes to being nominated for this award. In your experience, the athletes you've coached that have won this honor, what, what can you say about the teams that allowed them to achieve that individual success? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's no secret, and this is across the board in any sport, you just you can't have individual success without team success. You can't win a Katina Award, you can't win a Player of the Year, um, whatever it may be, whatever that award is, without your team having success. It's very rare that you'll see a team finish in the bottom of their conference or even in the middle of their conference, um, or even nationally speaking, and then also that, that individual having uh, success. So. Um, it's great. Uh, I think that's the way it should be because it, it puts an emphasis and a focus on not just that one person individually, but uh, again, making, um, you know, uh, helping to make the team perform to the best of their ability. And ultimately, the best, the very best are the ones that make those around them the best. And I think, uh, again, all three women's candidates uh, certainly had, had done that this, this past season. Well, we're getting closer to finding out who are this year's winners of the Catino Award, honoring the best in college water polo. And if you're just joining us, what is the Catino Award? Well, it's like other awards you know from some of your other favorite sports. Heisman in football, you've heard of that. The Naismith Award in basketball. How about the Hobie Baker? That's the prestige level of the Catino Award. The best of the best, and that's what we're recognizing here tonight. Who's won it before? It is a list of the very best in men's and women's college water polo. They've gone on to win national titles, Olympic medals, Hall of Fame honorees. That's who makes up the heritage, the history of the Catino Award. Let's not waste any more time. We're ready. You're ready. I'm looking forward to it. Who won the Catino Award? To fill us in, we send things over to our Master of Ceremonies, the Olympic silver medalist, the Hall of Famer, Chris Dorst. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Olympic Club of San Francisco and the 22nd annual Peter J. Catino Awards, honoring the very best players in men's and women's water polo of this year. I'm Chris Dorst, I'll be your host this evening, and for 22 years, we've honored the very best men and women in collegiate water polo with this prestigious award. And normally this banquet hall is filled with tables and laughter and clinking of glasses, with teammates and friends and referees and families getting together and honoring and loving and supporting the sport of water polo, but not this year. Once again, the pandemic has shut us down, so we're coming to you via webcast. But that doesn't mean that it hasn't been one heck of a year. The UCLA men beat USC for the 12th NCAA championship in program history last spring. Not to be outdone, the USC women turned the tables on the Bruins and beat the UCLA women last spring for their sixth NCAA championship in program history, led by six goals from Maud Megans, who's one of the finalists for the Women's Award this evening. But we know it has been a difficult year for all. We grieve with those of you who've lost a friend, a member of the family, or a teammate to this pernicious disease. The Olympic Club lost Andy Burke last year about this time. Now, for those of you under the age of 30, you may not have heard of Andy Burke, but let me tell you something. He's one of the giants of the game. He was a tremendous player, coach, referee, and a good friend to many of us. But ladies and gentlemen, now, for the reason we're all here, I want to turn the program over to my good friend and one of the greatest players of all time, Peter Conti. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Mr. Dorst. And thank you all in the Water Polo family for joining us again here tonight. Now, we're doing the Catino Awards again online in this virtual forum because the virus is still running rampant through the country. And in the 
effort of being as safe as possible, we wanted to make sure to not only communicate the esteem and prestige of the award, but obviously keep everybody safe as much as possible. So we very much thank you for joining us here tonight. This is the night that we honor the best collegiate players of the year for water polo in the name of the one of the most celebrated coaches of all time, the former coach of UC Berkeley and former coach here at the Olympic Club, Mr. Peter J. Catino. Peter J. Catino Award, it was founded here at the club back in 1999. So it gives you some, some history behind it. It was formulated as a collaboration between the board of directors here at the club and the water polo team itself. And the idea was to take the best of the collegiate players and to take the long-standing history of excellence that the club had and put them together to create what was hopefully going to be a long-standing, and now that it has been, uh, award to honor the best of collegiate water polo. The club's long history in the sport, over 100 years, uh, made it a natural fit to do just that. The award has grown over the past 20 years, uh, allowing us to celebrate this the 22nd year. And in the words of our inaugural speaker, Mr. Peter Uberoth, it has quickly become the Heisman Trophy for water polo. Now, Coach Catino was a force in water polo, and his um, coaching style and his guidance, it shaped a lot of lives throughout water polo, but I should say both in and out of the pool, and I count myself as lucky to be one of those people. And I'm going to have to read this next section because there's so many accolades and uh, kind of acknowledgments that it makes it hard to uh, not do so. Uh, coach Catino was a 25-year coach of UC Berkeley, an Olympic head coach in 1976, and among many other esteemed uh, positions and achievements, his collegiate teams earned eight national championships, a 519, 172, and 10 career record during his tenure. His last team in 1988, uh, they won a school record 33 games on the way to winning their second straight NC2A title. Catino coached 68 All-Americans, six Pac-10 and NC2A Players of the Year, and five Olympians. His no-nonsense style was tough but fair, and his Italian blood ensured a very let's call it vocal passion during the game itself. Uh, my favorite quote about Pete is from uh, the current head coach at UC Berkeley, Kirk Everest. Uh, and I wanna make sure I quote it exactly to get it correct. He taught us that anything worth accomplishing would not come without discomfort. And he was always there to administer that discomfort. Coach Catino, he was a firm believer that hardship and adversity made people stronger. Success was not measured by singular events or trophies or awards but that sports could reveal and illuminate character. I'd like to show you a video about him. The Olympic Club of San Francisco is the oldest athletic club in the United States. Since its founding in 1860, it has served men and women of all ages by enriching their lives through participation in the club's wide range of social activities, fitness programs, and organized sports. Teams and individuals representing the Olympic Club have produced over 20 Olympic medal winners, as well as achieved national and international recognition in a wide variety of sports. With a long and illustrious history in the sport of water polo dating back to the turn of the century, the Olympic Club is proud to celebrate the sport of water polo by annually recognizing the female and male collegiate water polo players of the year. And it's been said, it's really true, that the greatest names in the history of our sport are here tonight. They truly are. And they are a team, and they are a family, and tonight you join the ranks. You know, in sport, sport is something we take too serious, and other times not serious enough. To me, it seems to reflect a noble and notable sentiment that those who sacrifice the most to achieve a goal are the happiest of people. Embracing both the sport of water polo and one of its legends, Peter J. Catino, the Olympic Club formed the Peter J. Catino Award in 2000, celebrating the very best in collegiate water polo. The namesake of this award is the winningest coach in water polo history, winning 13 U.S. water polo and eight NCAA championships during his 26-year career as head water polo coach at the University of California at Berkeley. 
Pete Catino was named NCAA Coach of the Year four times and nurtured 68 NCAA All-Americans, six NCAA Players of the Year, and five Olympians. As coach for the Olympic Club, Pete Catino coached over a 12-year span, winning four U.S. Open National Championships, two World Masters Championships, and 10 Masters National Championships. Four of his players received U.S. National MVP honors, and eight players were current or past USA Olympians. Respected and admired by his peers for his knowledge of the game and ability to develop, motivate, inspire, and be a role model for his athletes, Pete Catino was elected into the U.S. Water Polo Hall of Fame in 1997. You know, it's true that the problems are victory are more agreeable than those of defeat, but they are no less difficult. Let me explain it to you. You are, tonight, recipients. You are the champions. To be the champion. The champion becomes the mark, the standard to achieve, to beat. The greatest effort is against the champion. Moral victories are gained against the champion. And if the champion, champion perseveres, then the pressures become that much greater. It is a tough, tough road to hold, but it is as it should be. It is competition, which is the basis of excellence. The award itself is represented right here uh, by this lovely trophy. It was created by longtime assistant coach of UC Berkeley, Mr. Doug Arth. He's a former All-American and national team member himself. The trophy remains on display here at the club year-round, uh, and exact replicas are given to the winners of this award every year, uh, and their names are engraved right on the plaque uh, so that they can stand uh, in perpetuity here as part of the club's history. Uh, a member board of trustees has been established to properly care for and administrate this award. Uh, this is where we usually give thanks to Gary Crook because of his unbelievable efforts in this uh, endeavor. Gary recently uh, left his post as athletic director here at the club, although he still remains an integral part of this award, and we'd like to obviously acknowledge him and all of the work he's done over many years, not just this one. Uh, I'd like to introduce at least just the board members themselves to give them a quick thanks and acknowledgement. Uh, Ms. Julia Sesnick, Mr. Chris Lathrop, Ms. Morgan Halleck, who's the Commissioner of the Women's Team. Mr. Colin Mulcahy, who is the Commissioner of the Men's Team. The Executive Director of the Katina Award and the former Athletic Director, who is Mr. Gary Crook. And then myself, Peter Conti. We'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the fact that Andy Burke, one of the original creators of this award and former uh, member, is no longer with us and we miss him deeply. The selection of the award winners is done by employing a double blind ballot process. There's an initial round of ballots that go out. From there, the finalists are selected. The ballots re-go out to all the coaches, and from the selection of those final three, the winners emerge. I should point out, and this has become uh, something to note, that the board members themselves do not influence the vote or do not sway any of the coaches themselves. They're simply here to maintain the award and the integrity of the voting process itself. And now the moment we've all been waiting for, the reason you're tuned in at home. Let's take a look at this year's nominees for the Mets. Year in and year out, Jacob Merchep has been a dominant force for USC. In 2018, he led the Trojans in scoring with 62 goals. In 2019, he did it again with 51 goals. In 2021, he refused to back down. He opened the season with a USC career-high seven-goal performance against crosstown rival UCLA. That trend would continue. He would go on to score in 15 games with 12 multiple goal outings. By season's end, Merchep notched 39 total goals in the short season, completing his three-peat as USC's top scorer. Merchep was named the MPSF All-Tournament Team, NCAA All-Tournament Team, and appeared in the National Championship game. He is a three-time first-team All-American and currently sits at number 11 on the all-time scoring list for USC. To have your name etched among the greats, you need to find overwhelming and consistent success. 
When Nicholas Savage found it, he never let it go. In 2021, Savage showed his prowess on both sides of the ball. He led the NCAA with 30 steals and commanded the conference leaderboard by racking up 37 points in 16 games. He also dished out 10 assists for good measure. On February 7th, he made history when he tied the all-time MPSF record for goals scored in a conference game with an eight-goal effort against the number one Stanford Cardinal. He finished the season on top, being named a first-team All-American, co-side a first-team academic All-American, ACWPC Player of the Year, and was crowned a national champion. When Nikos Papa Nicolau arrived at Cal in 2019, his impact was immediate and immense. The freshman led the Golden Bears with 72 drawn exclusions and 23 steals. He also scored 51 goals and posted 10 assists. He earned a spot on the All MPSF First Team and was named the MPSF Newcomer of the Year, and he was just getting warmed up. In 2021, Papa Nicolau scored in all 10 of the Golden Bears regular season games. He earned 44 ejections and was the only player in the MPSF to draw six exclusions against a conference opponent in a single game. He did it twice. Papa Nicolau finished the 2021 campaign with 26 goals and 14 steals. He was named First Team All-MPSF, First Team All-American, and was named the MPSF Player of the Year. Congratulations to all the men's finalists this year. It was some amazing water polo. The winner of this year's Catino Award goes to Nicholas Savalich of UCLA. Congratulations. Hello, everybody. My apologies in advance. Since English is not my first language, I hope you guys will still be able to understand me. I want to start off by saying how grateful and humble I am to receive this honor, and I would like to thank the entire Coutinho family, Olympic Club, and USA Water Polo for hosting and organizing this wonderful event. I would also like to thank all the coaches across the nation for participating and voting, as well as I would like to congratulate both finalists, Jakob Merchep and Nikolau, Papa Nikolau, for such an amazing season with both USC and Cal. First of all, my family in Montenegro, my motivation, my everything, my mom, Diana, my role model, Thank you so much for all the unconditional support and love you've given to me for all the late nights you stayed up waiting for me to come back from practice to make me a dinner and just ask how it went for teaching me all the, all the true human values that I was able to bring with me throughout the life. I am truly here because of you. Thank you so much for everything. My sister, Silvana, my best friend and the best older sister I could ever, I could ever ask for. Thank you for, for setting, setting the standards high and giving, giving an example for me to follow along the way, leading to a successful life and career. I want to thank my, thank my father, Nisha for all the little pre-game little pre-game uh, conversations for long motivational talks after the tough losses and tough games I want to thank you for for all the all the advices and and continued persistence lessons and teach me how to perform under the under the high pressure Next, I would like to I would like to thank my coaches, Adam Bright, Jason Fallitz, Ryder Roberts, Jack Grover, Casey Metoyer, Jake Bracewell, and our team psychologists, Lenny Viersma. I can't thank you guys enough for giving an opportunity to just an 18-year-old kid from Montenegro, a chance giving him a chance to achieve his dreams in one of the most prestigious universities 
in the world as UCLA is. Thank you for the given trust and for always keeping me accountable. You have taught me the importance of commitment, selflessness and grit, which shaped the person I am today. I am forever, forever thankful for you guys. And I hope to enjoy this last ride, last season, my fifth year in the best possible way and continue the legacy. Lastly, I would like to thank all the UCLA athletics, faculty, staff and members for continuously putting the effort to create such a unique environment for us student athletes to thrive in. And for the end, I would like to thank my teammates, my brothers and my family for first welcoming me back in 2017 and understanding how tough it is to adjust to a new environment, for always being there for me and for helping me feel like home since, since the day one. Thank you for always picking me up when I'm down on a daily base, putting a smile on my face. So many, for, for so many, so many good stories and experiences. I'm excited. I'm excited to get it done with you guys. Was last one more, one more time. So again, thank you so much for making this such a unique experience and for the, for the recognition. I hope everyone is staying well and safe. Go Bruins. All right, let's have a look at the women's finalists for this year. In 2020, the women's water polo season came to a screeching halt. But when Denise Mamalito was granted another year of eligibility, she was given the rare opportunity to be the backbone for her team once again. She did not disappoint. As the squad's captain in 2021, Mamalito set the tone. She recorded 13 multiple goal outings, including a seven goal game against the second ranked Stanford Cardinal. And she didn't stop there. She was relentless on offense, leading her team with 51 total goals. All told, Mamalito finished her Trojan career with everything a player could ask for. She was a two-time member of the All-MPSF First Team, a four-time All-American, a two-time national champion, and earned her spot as the number 10 all-time USC scorer with 174 goals. What does Mount Megan's accomplish during a down year? Well, she helps the Dutch national team qualify for the Olympics. What happens when she returns to USC? She continues to dominate. During the 2021 season, Megan's scored 50 goals for the Trojan squad. It became more impressive when you break it down. She scored five goals against number four UC Irvine, five goals against number four Arizona State, five goals against number six Cal, and six goals in the national championship game against rival UCLA. Bottom line, when it mattered most, Mao delivered. Over the course of her career, she scored 213 goals, claiming her spot as the number six all-time scorer for USC. Megan's finished the season as a first-team All-American, ACWPC Player of the Year, MPSF Player of the Year, MPSF Tournament MVP, NCAA Tournament MVP, and a national champion. Water polo runs deep in the class family. But when Sarah Class hits the pool deck, she provides her own definition of the sport's greatness. Just look at the 2021 season. Class shot to the top of the Cardinals scoring leaderboard with 47 goals and posted 12 multi-goal performances. In a game against the Indiana Hoosiers, she found the back of the net seven times. And it's not just her offensive prowess that commands the attention of the water polo world. In 2021, she led the MPSF with 67 sprints won. When it was all said and done, the senior earned MPSF All-Academic, MPSF All-Tournament Team, NCAA All-Tournament First Team, First Team All-MPSF, and First Team All-American Honors. Nice work, ladies. Really impressive stuff over the last two years now. The winner of this year's Peter J. Cattino Awards is Maud Megans of USC. Congratulations. 
First off, I want to thank the Cotino family, Olympic Club, and everyone involved making this evening possible. Congratulations to my fellow nominees, Sarah Klaas and Denise Mamolito. It's an honor to be nominated alongside Denise and have two players here representing USC as finalists for this prestigious award. Everyone always talks about the Trojan family, and as an international student, I didn't really know what to expect upon arrival in the US. But the immediate warm welcome and support I received made me feel like home instantly. My teammates are my sisters, and this award is just as much for them as it is for me. I'm lucky to be a part of an amazing program with amazing people. I'm sad I won't be able to jump in the pool and compete with them anymore, but being able to finish my college career with a national championship felt like a cherry on the pie. I want to thank all the people that supported me here and from home, starting with my parents for always wanting the best for me and supporting my dreams, no matter what the cost. My teammates for pushing me harder and always being there for me through the good and the bad. Pinta for his devotion and life lessons, bringing a team together and making sure everyone was their best self at the right place at the right time. Casey for all the hard work he did on and off the pool deck, making us prepare for anything that was thrown at us. Sandy for keeping me in one piece, all the warm hugs, love and care. Mimi for keeping me eligible in school and always being there for me when I needed someone to talk to. Darcy for working so hard for us, making the team look great and professional while always being available for a heart to heart. Tim for making me a fighter and a tough woman. And of course, Jeremy, Connor, Sandra and Brianna for being the most understanding and supporting coaching staff I've ever encountered. Lastly, I wanna thank Johan Vavish. I'll always be grateful for his passion, dedication and devotion for the sport. I wouldn't be the player I am now without him. Thank you all and fight on. All right, you've heard plenty from me tonight. You've seen the award winners. Let me turn it back over to our host with the most, Mr. Chris Dorst. Thank you, Peter. Congratulations to Maud and Nicholas and to all the nominees for showing us how well water polo can be played this year. We appreciate all that you are, all that you've done, and it was just so much fun watching you in real time. We'd personally like to thank the Olympic Club and their great staff for putting this whole program together. Now, back to Greg to wrap things up. Thanks, Chris, and that brings an end to a great night for water polo as we wrap up our Catino Awards presentation. Thank you all for being here and joining us, and a final congratulations to this year's recipients. First on the men's side, the UCLA Bruin, Nicholas Savalich. He was the ACWPC Player of the Year. That's sometimes an indicator of how the Catino Award will go. It was this year a national champion at UCLA, a first-team All-America pick. He was the team and conference scoring leader, 37 goals in just 16 games, including an eight-goal effort against Stanford and Currently, number six in UCLA history with 164 goals. And from Savalich to our women's winner, from USC, Maud Meggins, the national champion, the Olympian, a banner year for the native of the Netherlands. 50 goals for USC in 2021. Also the ACWPC Player of the Year, the MPSF Player of the Year, the NCAA and MPSF Tournament MVP, a first team All-America pick, and like Savalich, one of the best players in the game. So again, congratulations to both Nicholas and Maud, and thank you again for joining us for this Catino Award presentation. Fingers crossed, we're looking forward to seeing everyone back here in person inside the Olympic Club next June right here in San Francisco. But for now, we say thanks for being here. Thanks for watching. Thanks for supporting water polo. Greg Meskel saying have a great rest of your night and we'll see you on the pool deck soon.